November 1910, Eugene Ely took off from a modified Navy cruiser on the Virginia coast flying a Glenn Curtis airplane. Two months later, Ely landed on a different ship in San Francisco Bay. Naval aviation was born. Training soon moved from Virginia to Pensacola, Florida, which is the cradle of naval aviation. Every naval and marine aviator to this day traces his or her start in flying to Pensacola. Every Navy aircraft ever flown is housed in the Naval Air Museum at NAS Pensacola. Today, we honor naval aviation, then and now. Good afternoon again, and welcome our two guests, please. Adam, outside, please. Bill. Right here. Thank you. Uh, on my left, immediate left, is Bill Clares. Uh, Bill is president and co-owner of Westpac Restorations and president of the National Museum of World War II Aviation in Colorado Springs. So that's Bill. Adam Makos is a World War II historian and author. He has written two bestsellers, uh, A Mighty a Higher Call and Devotion, and is working on a third book now about Korea. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us today. So, <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Thank you, David. Um, Bill, start us off. Uh, your restoration operation is where? Well, the restoration operation of Westpac Restorations is on the campus of the National Museum of World War II Aviation in Colorado Springs. And what do you do there? Well, we try to make a living sometimes. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a passion. The, the business has been uh, going on for, I've been in this since 1982. And it's, it's evolved into a very high-end restoration shop. It's a 65,000 square foot. It's a state-of-the-art built for just restoration. And, uh, you know, we have a few small customers that, you know, a group of customers that we've had for many, many years. And, uh, you know, we've had the honor of uh, restoring some of the finest aircraft, I think, that fly in the warbird industry today. What's your mission there? And at the museum? Well, the mission, Dave, is really uh, education based. Um, you know, people don't, they, they haven't seen a lot about this museum because it's been a slow growth since it opened in like 2012, but it was like the end of 2012. We are open six days a week, but three days are dedicated to nothing but a formal education program. So we've been bringing. I think that's at 3,600 uh, children a year, or kids a year, but it's up to f over 4,000, which is a maximum capacity that we can do. And it's not a deal where the kids come out just to go see cool airplanes and stuff. It's a formal education program where they have 10 to 12 hours in the classroom, and then they come out and we give them a two and a half hour capstone project where they apply STEM education in a World War II environment which is a really cool thing to do because of the evolution and everything that transpired in World War II in science and technology engineering, you know, advancing, it's really neat. And, and what it does is you create a STEM program and because you're not really teaching World War II, but in the environment that you put it in, we're exciting kids because it's really not taught in a lot of the schools today. Are, how much are you seeing an effect on these young people, or is it too early to tell? No, we actually, uh, we have a very, very great program, and it's, it's uh, measured every day. I mean, before the kids come in, we'll take a program and we'll ask them how they feel about certain things in science, technology, engineering, math, and history. We keep throwing the history in there. Wow. And then you take that after they go through the, the formal education, and when they come to the museum, then we'll take another exam with them. And then we'll take, after they go through the final capstan program, we'll watch what they do. And then about a month or two later, we recapture that again. So we see if not only are you creating a, a, a movement of the needle, but is it staying with them? And we've learned over the years that 
uh, we can bring kids out of the classroom, bring them in, excite them about history and aviation. That's the passion we're trying to do, drive for a career in aviation. But then when you take them and put them back in four room, a room with the same teacher and four walls, it, it goes away because you haven't, you haven't given them a t continuum program. And so the museum has gone through several different things, creating a continuum program. The new campus will not only allow them to go through and then go into the volunteer program, but then uh, we're building a new facility right now, which we have uh, funding for an 80,000 square foot building. We have half of that funded. It allows us now to do five days of, of education along with five days of actual the muse museum being open. So now we're going to see a bigger amount of people coming through, but when they get through, you have to give them the place to go. So now we're putting in a full-blown A&P school alongside uh, with another flight program, which is the next one that we'll be doing. So you capture the kids because the museum is an inspiration point. That's what it is. And, and you grab them, but you got to keep them moving forward. So the programs that we're now producing allows those kids to continue on to see if that's really a career path that they want to do. Are you getting any feedback at all from the teachers when these young people go back to school? Are you learning anything from the teachers about these kids? Well, I'll, I'll tell you that really the hardest thing in the whole program isn't so much the kids, it's, it's the teachers themselves. You know, you're looking at teachers that are in their 20s to 30s, is China the average of bringing them in, and I, I a lot of the programs because I kind of help in, implement it and put it together. And I actually had a teacher ask me one day, she's going through the education program, teaching the teachers, and she stopped and she says, Bill, can you tell me what World War XI was? And I said, well, uh, young lady, I, as far as I know, we only had two world wars, and I don't think we got past three, and I'm sure we never made it to 11. And, and it, but the problem is, is if you don't educate the teachers, right. the teachers are afraid to bring kids out because the kids ask them a question and they can't answer it. It's 70 years, but it's so distant right now that it's, it's really a bad effect. I mean, I would never think that 70 years this far that it would become that distant and that's the problem so if they lose sight of history you're going to recreate it it's going to come back and they're not going to have it so you're bringing the teachers in to actually teach them before you bring the kids in actually the first year that we did the program we brought them in and they had to go through a formal program now the pro now that we are actually doing it online so that's allowed us to get a broader base and it, and it keeps moving and we're piling in a program that we can actually use throughout the country so that other museums don't have to go through the same pains that we've had to go through trying to figure out the system. And it really works good. We've got it so good right now that we have uh, uh, one of the major A&P schools is actually coming in and teaching kids in socially depressed areas within the Colorado Springs area, and they're kids that might not ever get it through a, a GED. And now what they're doing is they're creating a career path for these kids where they, the teachers are actually going in and teaching four days in the school, and they're taking the curriculum that they have to have, and they're, they're measuring it and changing it into what you would need to get an air, airframe and power plant license. The FAA has then granted us a trick, a, what they call our articulating agreements. So the kids are getting the inspiration to get a career. They are also getting articulating agreements that the time they spent in, in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade applies to their A&P school. So, you know, if they do go to that, that final career as a, a mechanic, then they've, they're going to get a huge reduction in what it costs, and they're going to have a career. And, and, and again, now you don't have to teach the teachers, you've got to go teach the parents. Because in, in areas that are quite depressed, we're finding that the parents are a little nervous of what's going on. But you're taking kids that would never make it through high school now, they've been given a career path, and, and in Denver area, three years in a major out there, you could be close to six figures. So you're taking kids that might not ever get out of, of high school, 
and given them a life, give them a career path. So it's a really successful program, and it's uh, it's in the pilot stage, but it's been working. To what extent has your program perhaps become a role model for other museums and restoration facilities around the country? Well, and that's what we would like to do. We'd like to be able to package this and take associations with other museums that are trying to do the same thing in their area. I mean, it it took a long time. We've worked on this program for 10 years. Right. What does the term national museum mean? And you are a national museum. <laughs> we were honored uh, in uh, December of last year um, by the Congress of the United States and, and the Senate. It, uh, the museum had been working towards creating a museum that would solely be dedicated to World War II aviation specifically. And that's the mission statement. The mission statement is that and education, and that's the basis that we're working in. So we're not trying to get outside of our box. So we received a designation. It was the 13th one that was given from the Congress of the United States, naming this museum as the National Museum of World War II Aviation for the United States. Well, Adam, how'd you get hooked on airplanes? Well, uh, David, it was really due to my grandfathers. Uh, one was a B-17 radio operator in the Pacific. The other was a Marine. And growing up, they would take my brother and me to um, museums, to air shows. And uh, we just fell in love with that era. But we didn't want to just read about it. We didn't just want to see the aircraft. We wanted to communicate to our peers, our, our schoolmates who were clueless to this stuff. So we started a newsletter about veteran stories. And that little newsletter grew into a magazine. And the magazine led to what I do now, which is I, I write books. And I'm just a hero worshiper. I mean, that really is what it is. It's about. Um, I see something in the veterans of World War II, Korea, Vietnam, values that, that I think would help us today. Um, tiger cats. Get around to talking about tiger cats. <laughs> <laughs> is that what um, you is that what they came out to listen to? Well, apparently. <laughs> That's what this is. Yeah. Uh, Adam, okay. how, how much do we know or do you know about uh, the role of the Tiger Cat in the Pacific War, World War II? Well, uh, the Tiger Cat arrived almost too late. I say almost because it got there the day before Japan surrendered. So, you know, it's technically a World War II veteran. It was developed in 1941 all the way through the war. So... Yeah, it's a World War II plane, but it really got its, uh, it earned its name in Korea. And it's such an appropriate aircraft for the Korean War. There's these similarities when you see Korea is just this unknown war. You know, when you see a, a veteran with a Korean War ball cap, a lot of people don't know, uh, you know, what were those battles about? Where did, it, where did he fight? Uh, all we know is MASH. I mean, that's really the standard for the Korean War. It's not very good. And it's the same way with the Tiger Cat. Um, what was its use in Korea? What did it do? Yeah. Uh, this was a night fighter, um, primarily, and it was put to use in these interdiction missions, basically uh, cutting the supply lines of the communist forces. A lot of people thought that um, this was the jet era. An aircraft like this would have been completely obsolete. There were people that talked about abolishing the U.S. Navy at that time. Where did that come from? It came from uh, the uh, GDP, mostly, of the United States. At the end of World War II, we were spending 40% of our GDP fighting that war. And after the war, we had to cut back. And Truman went crazy, and he, he started just hacking programs. So we went from having 98 carriers down to 15. And there were people that were saying we should have zero because uh, the atomic era was upon us. So if you're going to fight and every They were really talking about abolishing the Marine Corps and the Navy? Yeah. Why would you ever need an amphibious assault ever again when you have the atomic bomb? Why do you need an aircraft carrier? It can't accommodate a long-range bomber. So they said, let's make the Navy into car uh, cargo ships. Let's make the Marine Corps part of the Army. And uh, we don't need planes like the Tiger Cat because, you know, we're going to have these F-80s and these F-9Fs and, and the jets. But, uh, but they found out that um, when they actually got into the combat in Korea, there were a lot of things the jets couldn't do that this machine could step up and do. What were the other weapons primarily in the Korean War besides this airplane? And how long did it last in terms of being used in Korea? Well, the... Um, 
They were really caught flat-footed, and uh, they were scrambling. So they brought Mustangs, P-51s, F-51s up from Clark Field in the Philippines. Uh, the Valley Forge carrier with its Corsairs was rushed into the theater. They were gathering up Mustangs from the Air National Guard units stateside. They, were, they even had to go to Germany to the depots there to get iron bombs to fight the war in Korea. We were so unprepared, but those aircraft came in and they held the line. They prevented the Allied forces, the Americans and the South Koreans, from being pushed into the sea in the summer of 1950. And in the process, they annihilated the North Korean Air Force. And they, they stepped up and they showed that, for example, these F-80s, these jets over in Japan, everybody thought they were going to save the day. Well, they couldn't fly out of the muddy Korean airfields. And by the time they made that flight across the Sea of Japan, uh, they'd used up so much of their fuel that they couldn't loiter very long. Whereas the Corsairs and the Mustangs, they just put them down onto Korean soil and they went to battle. The P-47, however, was left home. Due to those budget cuts after the war, and also due to the idea, what was a P-47 good at? It was good at tactical air support. Um, it was good at smashing tanks and so forth. Well, who's going to need that in the atomic era? You know, they, they just wrote off the P-47 altogether. So they didn't have enough parts or planes to really get involved in the Korean War. Uh, but so in the early days, it was the World War II stalwarts that carried the weight. Was there any kind of a stalemate in Korea? There, there, there was, and um, it happened, uh, we thought we were going to win that war. We thought we were going to have it over by Christmas. And the Chinese kept saying, if you come close to the Alu River, we're going to jump into this thing. Because China never wanted to see a democracy on their border. They never wanted to see a unified Korea. And that was their big fear. And MacArthur downplayed, he said, we're going to drive the North Koreans across the border, we're going to unite the country. And the Chinese ambushed us. And basically, t air support allowed our forces to pull back to the 38th parallel, back to the starting point, basically. And the war became a static sort of war of attrition. And during that time, the Tiger Cats, of course, would go behind the lines. They were very useful for smashing bridges uh, and also for smashing these narrow-gauge railroads because the jets with their bombs couldn't, couldn't get slow enough. They couldn't be accurate enough. Their, their speed was too much. So these guys were great at smashing um, enemy supply lines. And another place they came really in handy, when you're fighting this war of attrition, at night, the North Koreans would send over their um, washing machine Charlies, uh, bed check Charlies. They were little Russian PO2 biplanes. And these biplanes had been used in World War II by the Russian night witch pilots. They would harass the German troops. Uh, they were female pilots. And so the North Koreans took that out of the Russian playbook and they would send these biplanes over. They'd load them up with five 100 pound bombs. The little thing could only you know, coast along at 95 miles an hour. And they would harass our troops up and down the DMZ there, the, or the 38th parallel. And so it doesn't sound like a big deal, but when this plane comes over, the searchlights come on, the anti-aircraft starts firing, the sirens start wailing, the guys in their foxholes and trenches try to shoot because they're trying to search for this plane in the dark. It succeeded in keeping our guys from sleeping, wearing them down. It was stressful. You didn't know if that bomb was going to fall on your head. And ultimately, they needed a plane that could deal with those guys. And the Tiger Cat, fighting at night, using its radar to track down these slow-moving biplanes, it could do what the jets couldn't. Because some of these jets, the F-94 and so forth, their stall speed was 110 miles an hour. And this, this little biplane is motoring along at 95 miles an hour. And so you have stories of jets stalling out, squadron commanders getting themselves killed, trying to take out these little biplanes. You have stories of guys actually hitting the biplane and then flying into the wreckage in their jet because the speed differential was so much. So this aircraft was able to navigate through the darkness, get to the right speed, and, and fight the, those little uh, washing machine Charlies, piston engine on piston engine. How many human stories have you pulled out of Korea that you've written about? 
Well, I focused on one in particular. Uh, it was an incredible Navy story, uh, you know, that branch of the service that shouldn't have existed at that time. It was a story of Tom Hudner and Jesse Brown, two Navy pilots. Tom was from the country club scene of New England, and yet he wanted to fly for his country. Jesse Brown was a sharecropper's son from Mississippi, and he went on to become the first African-American naval aviator. So they were very uncommon wingmen for 1950. And they went, went overseas, um, and they were fighting to save our Marines at the Chosin Reservoir battle, that battle where the Chinese jumped into the war, caught us by surprise, and suddenly the 1st Marine Division is surrounded in far north North Korea. And they called them the Lost Legion. And back home, the newspapers were preparing the American of an entire division. I mean, imagine that if you woke up and news from Afghanistan, oh, there's an American division encircled and about to be destroyed. That's what people were facing in November and December 1950. And our heroes, Tom and Jesse, went in with their Corsairs and they delivered this air support that allowed the Marines to escape, to live, to fight another day. But in doing so, Jesse Brown was shot down behind enemy lines, crash landed on a mountaintop. And the amazing thing about this, and why I say it's the one story I've just dwelled on, I wrote a book about, Tom Hudner did an incredible thing that day. His friend Jesse was trapped in his aircraft. He couldn't get out. He was in the snow behind enemy lines. Enemy troops are moving toward him. And Tom Hudner knew Jesse had a, a, a wife back home. He knew he had a two-year-old daughter. And he's about to watch an American pioneer die far from home. And Tom Hudner did something that has never been done since. It had never been done before. He said, I'm going in. And everyone else thought, what is he talking about? And Tom Hudner took one of those Corsairs. And when you walk around and, and take a look at him, it's a big machine. And he took it and he put it down on the mountainside. He basically made a carrier landing on a mountain alongside of his friend Jesse Brown. He got out into that snow to try to save his friend's life. And he earned the Medal of Honor for that. We lost Jesse Brown that day, but those two men gave us an example that has resonated through the decades. What's the legacy of all those who fought in Korea? I think the legacy can best be seen at night uh, when the satellites take pictures of, of the Korean Peninsula. The northern half is dark, it's black. And the southern half is full of light, and it's the lights from cities, it's the lights from towns. 51 million South Koreans get to live in light thanks to those Americans who went and fought the Korean War. And we lost uh, 33,600 people in 37 months of war. So it was on track to be a bloody, bloody war, and it already was by 37 months. And, and so I want people to look at that Korean War veteran hat and to see something more than MASH, to see something more than Don Draper, the hero of Mad Men. I mean, that's all we have to go by. I want them to see the, the true heroism of people who, for, who fought the Forgotten War. Uh, a famous author, James Mishner, who uh, served in the South Pacific during World War II, the Navy, and later was on a carrier during the Korean War. He wrote the book uh, South Pacific, and he wrote Tales of the South Pacific, and he wrote Bridges of Toko Ri. He said he held the Korean War veterans in such high esteem, he said actually higher than us World War II veterans, because he said the, the soldier or the Marine on Guadalcanal knew that back home his whole country was behind him. He said, our fighting men in Korea never had that luxury. As you, Bill, listen to Adam uh, talk this history, uh, how does that sit in your head every day when you go to work in terms of your mission? Well, I mean, our, our, uh, you know, before I got into aviation, I was in a pretty good-sized construction company that I was a co-owner in. And, and, you know, I always tell people if I wanted to, you know, continue making a lot of money, that's probably what I would do. But I think somewhere in your life, you you get a change, and I was honored to meet a good friend of mine here this this last week here at Oshkosh, Jim Kidrick, who was very instrumental in uh, putting together the 50th anniversary of the Doolittle Raid on Tokyo by launching two planes off of a carrier, and uh, and I was one of those two airplanes, and we worked together, and you. It was a life-changing thing, you know, you get your tight flight suit on a little too tight, and you think, wow, this is all about me flying off an airplane, and then 
or a carrier, excuse me, and then you, you go out and you sit down with the raiders the night before and all of the people and you listen to what the sacrifices that were made and, and what happened and you realize we're, we are just reenactors in this. We're not the people. We're not the original people that did this. And it, it alters my life and it changed it to where I realize it's not just about money. You know, you, it's not about making money and doing it. If you make enough to survive and you're happy and you love what you're doing, uh, you've got the best career in the world. And so, I mean, I've told people for the last 25 years, I've never had to go to work. You know, I love it. But it's, it's, it's like, you know, he said, it's, it's about the history and it's keeping it alive and keeping it something that, you know, the younger generation will be able to see and breathe and feel. And it's, you know, like, again, it goes back to the mission of the museum and people like Jim Slattery and, and others that are around here in, in this industry is, you know, make it to where it keeps going and it excites them and it, it gives them the honor, the, the, the thought of keeping this thing going. When did you get uh, the first ideas about, about tiger cats and bringing them into the museum and restoring? My tiger cat, I guess my love for tiger cat goes back into the 80s when I my, went out and flew it over in a T6 with my brother, went to Chino walking around and there's all these cool airplanes and all these different museums and down on the other corner was Dave Talachet's hangar and sitting out there this one day was a big blue twin engine airplane and I I said well let's go check this out you know we walk around and you you got on the nose just look down the nose of this airplane and I looked at my brother and said if I can ever if I will ever own a fighter it's going to be a tiger cat and so that it became a love and a desire. And fortunately for a guy that's a working man like myself, it was it was a plane that was kind of out of the text of World War II. You know, just because it didn't have provenance so much in World War II, and and so there were a lot of them that were still around that were fire fire bombers and that sort of a thing. So it became something that we could get our hands on. But it was always the dream, and uh, it's. I'll tell you what, it's the most awesome airplane I have ever flown and I will ever fly. How many of these were built? You know, and I don't remember the exact number, but you're the historian, so tell us. Around 370. <laughs> I think it was like 367. Right. Something. It was a test. Not that many. <laughs> yeah. How about 375, Jim? Where's Slattery? <laughs> I think it was 375. Yeah, 375 sounds yeah. right. The, um, um, is there a movie in the work? Are you working on making a movie out of this Korean story? Yeah, we're, what we're hoping to do is to bring the warbirds in particular to the big screen for the first time in a while and to make the first Korean war movie since Pork Chop Hill. Back in 1956, Gregory Peck uh, you know, showed us the Korean War, and nobody has ever since. And so the, the book I wrote, Devotion, uh, I'm really pleased to say that a really great Hollywood production company has picked it up. They've acquired the rights, and they're developing it right now. Oh. Uh, it's a company called Black Label Media, and they, made, uh, they make really quality films. Um, they made a movie called 12 Strong about the uh, horse soldiers in Afghanistan. They made the movie Only the Brave about the firefighters in Yuma, Arizona, the Sicario series. They even had their hands in a great movie called The Blind Side. And so our story is a bit of all of that. It's a bit of a war story. It's a bit of a story of friendship uh, across racial lines. And um, they've got an actor. His name's Glenn Powell, and he is going to play Tom Hudner. Glenn was one of the stars of Hidden Figures, a movie that came out a few years ago and was nominated for a whole bunch of awards. He's an up-and-coming uh, star. He was considered for the role of Goose's son in the new Top Gun 2 movie. So he, his stock is hot. And um, they're going to use real aircraft. And that's the fun of it. Uh, that was one of the first questions I asked them. I said, are we going to see real Corsairs or are we going to have a Red Tails situation all over again? And uh, they said, no, we're going to get the real ones. So there's already talks with owners going on. And um, I think we're going to assemble quite a little stable of those Good. things. and. Good. Put the Korean War on the big screen. Good luck with it. Thanks, David. Bill Clares and Adam Makos, thank you, gentlemen, very much. <laughs> thank you. Sam Bass.
Here's Sam Bass, extraordinary aviator, 35,000 hours as a pilot. Sam, it's all yours. We'll Thank see you. what Thank we can learn about the Tiger Cats. Thank you for those kind words, David. Bill, would you come up with me and talk to us a little bit? And I've also got Stu with me. Stu's going to talk to us about actually flying the airplane, and you obviously built this. And so could you just tell us a little about not these particular airplanes, but just something about uh, the horsepower, what engines it has, and the armament that they would carry, that sort of stuff. Well, as you can see on this plane here, the Tiger Cat had, uh, with a Dash 3, it has uh, four 20 millimeter cannons in the in the wing, and then it has four 50 caliber machine guns that are in the nose. <laughs> which, if you go back to the idea of the P38, why was it so successful? Was because it didn't have, you know, wing guns that were out shooting in a trajectory to somewhere. So it was shown that being able to shoot off the nose made the aircraft very successful. Um, the plane was also car carrying, uh, they could put a, I think it was a 2,000 pound torpedo on it and uh, two 100 or two 1,000 pound uh, bombs on each side and then they had the rockets on the wings that came in later on. So it, it was very formidable but obviously when you only shoot down a polycarp up PO2 it's, uh, I'm glad I wasn't in the polycarp up, I can tell you that. So. <laughs> So what? Uh, the, the, you had another tank on the bottom of this that you could go for long range? Well, yeah. What you see here is a configuration. We did this on purpose so you can see the two 150-pound, or excuse me, 150-gallon drop tanks. And on this one, you see a 300-gallon drop tank. The plane was actually capable of carrying 1,200 gallons of external fuel. It could have two 300s and one on the belly, although they said probably you shouldn't carry that much. But this plane was really built um, and came out as a carrier-based airplane. It was going to be an intercept plane for the kamikazes. So when it came out, it didn't really have a lot of fuel in it. Um, as Stu will tell you, that you take off in this airplane with outdrop tanks on and you fly for an hour and a half, you better kind of be over a fuel stop. It'll pass everything in the air but a fuel stop. Yeah. But the thing is, is that, you know, it didn't have to have that for a mission. The mission was to take off, climb as quick as you could, and I will guarantee you there's a lot of faster going up the bear cat or the tiger cat. We all know it was a tiger cat. Right, Stu? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I agree. So uh, that had, that's all it had to do. It climbed at 4,500 feet a minute, and in our configurations we're doing today, it can actually fly even faster than that going up. Go up, intercept, and return to base. That was what it was designed for. Did it ever qualify for carrier? Yeah, the Dash 4 was qualified um, you know, as a carrier-based airplane. Like some airplanes, they have to go through all the qualifications to make sure they can do it. And there's early versions and later versions, but it was it was qualified on carriers. Folks, this is Stu Dawson. He's got he's qualified in a in a number of of uh, military aircraft, and so I'd like for you compare flying this airplane and you flown the B-26. Compare the two. Well, this airplane, uh, it's got a lot more get up and go than a B-26 as far as acceleration and getting in the air. This airplane will get in the air uh, two different type wings. You've got, you know, the big old thick wing on this thing, and then you've got the laminar flow on the B-26. So this airplane will climb a lot quicker. The A-26 or B-26 will outrun this aircraft on top end, but as far as doing maneuvers and everything, they won't even touch this. The horsepower is about the same, though, isn't it? Yeah, they're both running 2800s and everything. This is 2100 horsepower. It's a Dash 34. Well, how is it, how is it to land and take off? This one's, uh, they're really nice. I mean, it just, you set it up, it's all laid out, and it just, it hits the ground, and it's there. It's, it's not hard at all. It's not as hard as the A26. Now, you mentioned that there was no nose gear steering on this thing. Was no. the hardest part to learn how to taxi it? No, it's real easy. You just use brakes just like any other. It just, it just goes. And this is a fully castering nose wheel. And, uh, and you told me over here that, did you think there was, what, seven of them still flying? 
Isn't that right, Bill? I think there's seven that can fly right now. There's seven uh, aircraft that we know of that are flying, and, and this museum has two of them. And if you guys haven't noticed the numbers on the side of the airplane, these two, these two aircraft were sequential serial numbers. So we have 80374 and 80375. They both came off the factory in March of 1945. So that one was first, and that one was the next one. Was this toward the end of the production? No, the production went further on than that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, Mr. Makos made a comment about, you know, the, the airplane not having a lot of provenance in World War II. And I, I don't really look at it that way because, we, you know, we got a cool thing in the museum. We got two huge Tiger Cats, and we have a, one of three of the three flying F3Fs in the world today. And you can put the F3F in this spot right here. And if you take a look at it in the evolution of World War II, it's not just about the airplane, it's what the manufacturers did. That F3F was an 800 horsepower, wooden wing, fabric, you know, it was the state of the art carrier based fighter in World War II when we went into it. This is the evolution of four years later from the same factory. So you had a Wildcat, Hellcat, and the Tiger Cat. First nose gear carrier-based airplane, first twin engine carrier-based airplane. That's a, that's a lot of history in World War II, and maybe it wasn't all about what it did in the air, but where did it take it to in the evolution of aircraft? You know, the Bearcat was the last one that came out. It was being designed the same time this was. It was the last uh, tailwheel carrier-based airplane. This was, this was state-of-the-art technology. If you And these... These would not fit on the smaller carriers. They had to go on the larger carrier. Yeah, they were enterprise. That's correct. Well, you, we really do appreciate you bringing your airplanes here. And this now, Slattery, restoration, sir. actually, Slattery's airplane. <laughs> and where it is, he's already gone, and, he, and thank you for bringing it in. The Navy's first ace was Naval Aviator No. 85, David Ingalls, in 1918. Flying a British Sopwith Camel for the RAF, he shot down five German airplanes in six weeks. Plane design and production proceeded unstopped for the next 20 years, and by World War II, naval aviation had become a power to defend our way of life, particularly in the Pacific Theater, after the surprise Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. Just four months later, in April 1942, Jimmy Doolittle led 16 Army Air Corps B-25 bombers from the Navy carrier Hornet in a daring raid. They accurately and successfully bombed targets in Japan that sent a strong message to the Japanese leadership. The message? You made a huge mistake bombing America. Navy planes dominated in the Pacific War. Fighters, the Grumman Cat series, the Wildcat, the Bearcat, the Tiger Cat, and the Hellcat. Hellcat pilots shot down over 5,000 Japanese airplanes in the Pacific. The late Alex Vashu, the Navy's fourth ranking ace, said that he loved his Hellcat so much that if it could cook, he'd marry it. And there were dive bombers, the Douglas SPD Dauntless, that was a key in destroying Japanese aircraft carriers at the Battle of Midway. and the Helldiver that replaced the Dauntless. There were PBYs and the Kingfisher spotter and rescue planes and of course the 400 mile per hour Corsair and the TBM Avenger torpedo bomber. The Avenger flew its first combat in 1942 at the Battle of Midway. In 1945, Avengers triggered the attack that sank Japan's mighty battleship, the Yamato, that helped end World War II 
in the Pacific. The Avenger and all of the other Navy aircraft and their crews are the stuff of legend. Is that normal for your wheel to pass you after you land? I don't think so. 
Uh, so, and he has a one in slow-mo here, Jim, if you, uh, you want to keep watching that. I, I touched down and on rollout, uh, I uh, had a, uh, could feel the movement of the uh, aircraft and then uh, the tire uh, let go. The, the actual, the tire did not blow. Uh, as you watch it here in slow motion, the rim separated and the, the tire came off of the aircraft and I'm now skidding on the wheel, the actual metal uh, magnesium and there's the magnesium fire you see which quickly goes out and my tire decided it wanted to be in the lead so there it goes. Uh, as the pilot, I'm just controlling the airplane, and as it's slow, that has a full castoring nose wheel here, so as it turned, I turned, was very slow. For me, it was just control the airplane and uh, take care of it. Mr. Slattery, what was it like for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if I'll ever lend Connie Bowen an airplane again. <laughs> No, the, the truth of the matter is these things happen and uh, this could have been a tragedy. These airplanes are treasures. There's very few of them. They take years and years to restore. They're worth unbelievable amount of money. And Connie, I have to tell you, I, when it happened, I was happy that she was safe, but more so I was impressed by the way with all the years of her skill put into action. Anybody else could have put this airplane in a ditch and it would have been over. She controlled it brilliantly. What could have been a, a tragedy turned into a, a minor inconvenience for the fire department. <laughs> and for us, fortunately, we brought an extra wheel and we were back in business the next day. But um, I'm so proud of you, the way you handled it. Thank you. Because she is an extraordinary pilot. Unfortunately, she's going to be razzed for the rest of her life about this. <laughs> but uh, what we determined after looking very closely at it was that the, uh, occasionally there's, it's a, a tube tire configuration. And uh, under stress, the wheel can move a little bit and tear the tire stem out. So that's what happened. And the tire went flat. And as you can see in the, in the video, when that happens, the bead that holds the tire, the wheel together, has no pressure holding it together, and it disassembles, and not usually goes faster down the runway than the airplane, but in this case it did. And uh, that magnesium, the big concern we had was with the magnesium wheel, you can't put magnesium out without a fire department. So we were luck the lucky thing was that the wheel went out uh, did not catch fire, the airplane did not catch fire. But the biggest danger, once again, was that this could end up in a ditch, and you did a great job. Thank you. And just to show you how much confidence I have in her, she's flying again tomorrow, right? Tomorrow. <laughs> so, good for Connie. I will add that, that I, I truly appreciate the opportunity to fly uh, any of these beautiful airplanes. There's several people here who tr do trust me with their treasures. And as our friend Jack Roush says, uh, we are the keepers of the treasures. So I will always attempt to take care of the airplane. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for your confidence in me and the nice words that, that you've said. Thank you. If you love airplanes, especially Navy airplanes, you will love visiting this incredible museum and its National Flight Academy for 7th to 12th graders on Fetterman Way at the museum. For plane lovers, another mesmerizing aviation museum with scores of warbird aircraft is the National Museum of World War II Aviation in Colorado Springs. Besides the remarkable airplane restoration efforts there by Westpac Restorations, now the museum has created an amazing a STEM education program for young people from K through 12 that includes World War II aviation history. The program continues to inform 3,600 students each year at no expense to the schools that teach the program. The idea, of course, is to help ensure that new generations of young folks will explore and support aviation for decades to come. 
Westpac, in fact, restored one of the tiger cats that we feature today. <laughs>